Hey, somebody's going to take an emergency vacation. Got it booked? Excellent. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. You're listening to the Professional Noticer. Here, you and I will use common sense and all the wisdom we can muster to move beyond what is true and go all the way to the truth. With actual listeners in more than 100 countries, I am the Professional Noticer. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Andrews. Hey, thank you for making me a part of your week. My purpose here today and with every show we do is to play the part of a best friend or a coach. I want to help you live the life of your wildest dreams by giving you access to the greatest mentors the world has to offer today. Our sponsor this week on the Professional Notice are our good friends at Tucker ATV. Highway 43 North in Jackson, Alabama. I know you probably say, well, where's Jackson, Alabama? It doesn't really matter, all right? Now, they're 60 miles north of Mobile. It's Highway 43. Um, it's the north side of town it's where Tucker ATV is. But when I say it really doesn't matter, it's because for people in 14 states, it hasn't really mattered. I mean, can you imagine? People from 14 states do business with Shannon and Lisa Tucker. They've got all the Polaris ATVs, the the big Ranger Cruise. They, they've got everything. They got the Hustler lawn equipment, including the big zero turn stuff. They've got the uh, Echo power tools, and not just the small selection that's in the big box stores. They've got everything. Okay, and the place is like a destination. Right? It's an indoor. Uh, porch that they have with the porch swing and you can have coffee with Shannon and Lisa. There's taxidermy, including some taxidermy from the world champion uh, who is uh, from Dodgeville, Wisconsin. They've got antiques in there. It's it's an unbelievable place. The main attraction to many of us is Shannon and Lisa. The, you know, you got to go and read some of the stuff that Lisa writes on her Facebook page. It's funny. It's great. They'll be your buddies, too. And so that's Tucker ATV, Highway 43 North in Jackson, Alabama, the small town business with the national reputation. Okay, observations and answers. That's what we do here on the Professional Noticer. And today is a, is a very special episode for me because, uh, you know, I tell you that I'm going to bring you the greatest mentors the world has to offer. And I really believe we are doing that. You know, we're trying to f- find different areas that, that people would, would be interested in and mentored in. But uh, I'm bringing you today a person who has mentored me. In fact, probably from the very beginning. Um, it's one of my oldest and best friends. Please welcome Brent Burns. <laughs> <laughs> Brent, wake up. Wake oh, up, buddy. Oh, oh. hey. Is hey. There, is there a bathroom? Yes, is there, there is. is. Yes, I'll be have, right back. Yes, okay? we have several. <laughs> so, man, thank you for being here. My pleasure, man. How now, I, I just got, you know, I got to tell you that. I, 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 why, why am I surprised that you would do something like that? Because Brent... Brent is one of the funniest people that I know, but he is also... He has known me long enough... That with Kevin Perkins, he's probably one of the few people that, he, you know, you, you don't seem to mind embarrassing me. Oh, no. Mind? I love, we love it. <laughs> it's a, it's a, one of the joys in life. <laughs> you know, Brent and I met. I got to tell, tell where, where we met. This is uh, it was when it, the time when I was on the beach. And, and Brent was uh, and has been. you the hot entertainer. In this whole area on the Gulf Coast, now that's true. That's true, and uh, and so the big the big venue at that time was the Holiday Inn in Gulf Shores. True, might have been the only venue, but it was the big venue. The only one with carpet. The only one with, with carpet. carpet. There you go. And uh, and I never will forget seeing that big sign out front, and it said Brent Burns in Lounge, and I always thought that was kind of like a human sacrifice. Brent Burns <laughs> in Lounge, uh, but I went in. One night, and I said, hey, I'm uh, a comedian, and I'm working out some new material. And it, it was new, because it was the first time I'd ever done it, you know? <laughs> yeah. and, and, so, and, and, I, and so I asked you, could I go between your sets? And you said yes. 
And I will always, you know, because that was the first night I found out there's a big <laughs> difference in being funny for people who love you and being funny for people who don't care. Yeah. And I will always be grateful because I, I stood up there and I don't know what I did, but <laughs> I had, there were probably about 30 people that stared at me, but I would hear Brent out there going, <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> and, and, and now I realize that you were just like saving me. <laughs> I mean, because that night I thought, well, you know, he thought it was funny, but <laughs> <Yeah>. well, <laughs> <laughs> that's not quite true. Huh? I kept thinking if I if I acted like it was funny that eventually it might get that way. <laughs> it might wow. it might become funny. Wow! But you know, it's stand up. I don't want to tell you is the toughest business in the world. I've well, tried a couple of times. It's that's a that's a, a loneliest feeling in the world when it's not working. Am I right? Oh yeah, you're right. But see, but. But the other thing is, and I I have since taken this into account, is that those people were, I guess, subconsciously comparing me with you because I wasn't just going in there to take the break of a singer. You're a very special kind of of act, okay, because you do funny songs yeah. and you're funny. And so, you know, here's a guy who's a comedian, and I think back on this too, that at the time, there weren't comedy clubs all over the country. No. You know, there's only a couple in New York and a couple in L.A. Right. And so all the people in the audience, none of them had ever seen a live comedian. And even when I got through, they still hadn't. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but it, it was, I still remember that look. There's people just like, what? What, what is this? Yeah, well, it was, it was, well uh, if I could just interject something here, I, I do remember that night, and I remember that you used to come in as you tried to, you know, learn that trade. You used to come in and, and do this quite often, but I remember you would come in. And you were the, kind yeah. for the first few times. It was not very funny, but there was a point. I don't remember when it was. There was I don't know how many times you'd come in, but there was that one night you got in, and it was funny. It really was funny, and I realized you'd figured it out. You, you were starting to figure it out because it was a, the, the difference was night and day. Suddenly. You had your timing down, and you had some actual jokes and some stuff. I think the first time you were just kind of rambling because yeah, you wanted to try it. But but you got you know it. It was a really good moment for me to see. Hey, he's. I think, you know, I think he's got it. I think he's figuring it out. You know, and once you get on that path to figure yeah. it out, you know, once you're wandering around without any direction, once you find that path, you know, you you, you, you took the ball and you ran with it. You know, when you said. That first night, I was kind of rambling. <laughs> that is because there was one thing that I had not figured out, and I mean a major thing, and that was, you know, if you watch, we would watch comedians on the Tonight Show, and I, you know, I'd think, oh, I'm funny, yeah. I could do that. He's just like, and, but I didn't understand that the guy was doing a song. I mean. This was practice. This was the illusion of spontaneity. Right. You know, if people th would think Robin Williams was so spontaneous. Yeah, that's why he did it 10 nights in a row at the comedy store before he was spontaneous on The Tonight Show. Right. And, and so, but I was fooled by that. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I say now, the better a speaker is or the better a comic is, the more it should look like he's just kind of standing there talking. And so I was fooled by that. And I thought I could just stand up yeah. there and be funny. And, all, uh, yeah. yeah, it's it's uh, it's it's true. You, you, preparation is just the key to it. But again, uh, our business, uh, the comedy business or the music business, I've always said the better we are at it, the less it looks like work. That's and right. Sometimes people don't realize we're working. That's they think exactly it's just, right. This is a, anybody can do this a piece of cake, and and I get negotiations over money. Sometimes people forget the fact that it's what I do, and, and it's taken years of preparation. But it is work, and the better I'm at, it looks like I'm just breezing through it. You know? Right. And, and and I do love it. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but uh, uh, what's the singer's name? Fr uh, Tony Bennett yep. said something one time on a Charlie Rose interview. He said, uh, he asked him why he always looks so enthusiastic on stage. He says, I always try to act like, to my audience, there's nowhere else in the world I'd rather be than right there, right now. And right. I, I thought that's great advice for any entertainer of any kind. Boy, you're not kidding. Yeah. You're that's not like kidding. It. I want people to know some of your background, too, because – and I see the little not smirk. The not the shady part. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. no. But, I, but, the, but you have become this uh, – 
And I think think he's probably quietly become this icon of comedy music. You write these songs that that nobody else does. And and the first time, a lot of people will remember this. So you remember the Arab oil embargo. And I was just listening to some historical thing about it the other day Mm -hmm. in the 80s. Well, uh, everybody remembers Paul Harvey. Right? Mm-hmm. Paul Harvey. Mm-hmm. Okay. The rest of and, the story. <laughs> and Brent Burns. Now, Paul Harvey never played music, never played a single song in the history of that man's broadcast. And Brent wrote and recorded a song that Paul Harvey actually played three times in one week. And the song sold millions of copies and... T- tell them about the song. Tell them the name of it. Well, it's called Cheaper Crude or No More Food, which was it's an anthem against. I found out that we were shipping like wheat and food over to the Arab countries, and they were scalding us on the price and the shortage of, of oil. So I was kind of ticked off, and so I wrote a funny song about it. <laughs> and and actually wrote it in the song in 76. And in 79, a friend of mine remembered it and sent it to Paul Harvey. And it just happened quick because he—, he got permission to use it. He just said, ask permission to use it if we wanted to. We didn't know what he was going to do, and he didn't tell us. And so one day on a Wednesday, he played the doggone song, and it just blew up. I mean, it, from that point on, it was a track race for months. You know, uh, We didn't have a record deal. Uh, a company flew in from Nashville and signed signed us. Uh, you know, We got calls from the BBC, from B'nai Brith. Uh, uh, New York Times, L.A. Times, Chicago Tribune, Billboard Magazine. I mean, going from an obscure lounge lizard singer guy, I was kind of, you know, I mean, you know, I'm singing in lounges to a sudden, you know, real people's calling and hee haws calling. It's like, really? You know, it was it was hard to get your balance, you know. It, it went fast. It, you know, novelty songs usually do. But it was it was a great experience. We did sell several, uh, you know, I think a half a million copies the first week. I didn't get any paid for any of those, by the way. The company went bankrupt. Are you serious? Yeah, but it was a real learning experience, though. I mean, I, I look back and I just laugh at, uh, you know, it was a, but we still had a great time. I mean, it was, it was a great learning experience. You know, I made money on airplay and some performance money, but God paid you back with a horse. We'll talk. Well, about, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. You, oh, you yeah. may, you I'm may not, have that's felt. That's why I'm not complaining. Yeah, you may have felt screwed with that uh, record deal, but God paid you back with a horse. Oh well, so, in many ways. I yeah. mean, I've been. I, I've. I feel like my life has been the most uh, fortunate, blessed life in the world. I just. Uh, I sometimes in the morning, when I, I, every morning I write a letter to God. Have you ever told you that? Right. I write, dear God, and I just write my feelings. You know, usually it's to thank a thank letter of thankfulness. And I ask for things sometimes, but but uh, I every day thank for the for my amazing life. It's been just it's so much fun and, and it's been so exciting and so uh, diversified. You know, it's been great. You, you know? know, it's not the time. It's not the time in this interview to get all gushy and everything. You usually say that to the end, but I gotta I gotta tell you, you have been a constant and consistent influence in my life for. 35 years. Oh, well, yeah. Thanks, Andy. And, and, and I mean, this, uh, you know, I wonder how, how much uh, uh, you, you had gigantic butterfly wings flapped in my life oh, years yeah, ago thanks. because, you know, you mentioned the many times I came in that, you know, yeah. early on. And, I mean, you think about this. I mean, here's a, here's a guy. I was not doing well. It wasn't like I was coming in there and killing him. Right. It wasn't like I was adding to the evening. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm sure you got more than a couple of complaints about it. But but it, Brent let me keep trying. Kept encouraging me. Kept saying, "Hey, maybe on that one you do this a little way." And um, but you have been that guy for me for 35 years. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you a little. Addition to that story, you know, I've watched your career blossom and and, and great, found great joy in that because of that. But also, I have found myself being in the the student role, watching your and, and learning from you as you uh, developed your career. And so, it's been inspiring to me in one way. Also, I've learned a lot too. I mean, I've, from, from uh, some of the things you've taught me. So it's it's the roles have been reversed a little bit too. Occasionally, well, so we, it's, really true. it's a it's a mutual. It thing is. It is. I was talking with. Uh, I was talking with a client the other day, and and I uh, used one of the greatest examples that you ever gave me. And I, I even gave you credit. After all this time, I said, uh, there's a guy you probably know in my life, a guy named Brent Burns. And we were talking about 
how you know life would be so much better you know the fame and the money and the you know recognition or whatever you're going for life would be so much better if you had a faucet and you could just say well i need a little more money right now i'm just going to open that faucet i need to be recognized a little bit i just oh i don't want anybody to see me today and just close that faucet (laughs) i remember you telling me that didn't work that way, does it? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and I and and I I need to tell everybody one more thing that Brent told me that I've never forgotten. That you know the big speakers to talk about humility and they talk about how it's important, you know, in the corporate environment, humility. And all that. let me tell you how Brent got this uh, across to me. It, it was right about the time that I was starting to get on television. Right. And I'd been on a few times and I came home um, and and Brent had just come over the house. Right. About the time I got home, it was actually in the condo. We were still yeah. up in the condo. And and I came in, and I said, man, I, you know, this, uh, people stopped me in the airport and some people wanted their picture with me. And and, uh, you know, they wanted, they wanted to talk to me. And so I was in the airport and they. You know, they asked to take my pictures. I posed with them and, and all like that. And Brent just patiently listens, you know. And I'm just, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm amazed and I'm kind of bragging about you. Know, and people, they recognize me and they say, oh, we love you on that show, that show. And, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm kind of going on and on. Brent just lets me go on and on. And then finally he says, hey, I just want to remind you of something, just something to think about. That, that anytime you get to thinking that you're, you're a big deal because people are wanting to take the picture with you or stuff like that. Just remember, they do the same thing to the guy who wears the Donald Duck suit at Disney World. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, so every time they're doing that, I want you to think about, you know, Donald and, and just like wagging your tail, you know, just that they're, just a, that they're doing the same thing to him. And I still remember you standing up going like that. I was like, yeah, okay, that's a good point. <laughs> Well, it's hard to stay humble, especially when it happens the first time. When you first get that notoriety, right. and so it's it's pretty heady stuff, you know. And you know, if you you know, if I'm your first time, somebody want me to sign something, like the chief, chief recruit, will you give me get your autograph in a, in a Denny's? And I, and I think I refuse. I was I didn't I didn't know how to react to all that stuff. It's like, no, I don't, I don't, I can't do that. You know, I didn't think I was worthy. You know, uh, but then after a while, I got to where, oh, sure, kid. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, oh, I, I've had my cocky phases. Believe me, believe me. But they're you know, sometimes they're you know, t- life is hills and valleys. Yeah, and you know. But like cheaper crude, everybody was wanting my, you know, wanting to be with me and want a piece of the action and want to be around me. And all of a sudden, you know, one day you wake up six months later and the phone's not ringing and nobody answering your phone calls. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good experience. It at least teaches you to, to savor the good times when they're there, not be cocky, savor them, be humble about it. That way, when things aren't going so good, uh, I think you're, you realize that's not forever either. Right, you know, because it's not. This is not forever. Up, up top, down the bottom, not forever. If you recognize those things, stay humble up here. I think when you reach to have a bad time in your life, you realize this is not forever either. It's, right, they're, they're both temporary. Man, so. that's good stuff. Feels some That is good stuff. Yeah. You, you have have written songs. You've been consistent with writing songs for how many years? Oh gosh, <laughs> more than I'd like to say. Probably forty years at least. Right. At least, yeah. Did you did you start writing before? Or after Vietnam? Mostly after. In fact, I didn't write a lot in the 70s. I had that one hit, but I always kind of thought I'd be a star and I wouldn't have to write. You know, I'd be, I was, I was, I was really cocky back then. I mean, I was really too self assured almost. But, uh, and then I got to Nashville in 80, you know, moved there and thinking I would have become a, a, a signed artist and stuff, a star. And I started hearing uh, some of these guys that doing demos that were actually killer voices and great songs. And I'm thinking, I need to write songs because there's a lot of great singers around and I'm not a great singer. I'm a good singer. So that's when I really, when I got to Nashville, I started really taking the writing things seriously and it's become really a passion with me. I really like that end of things, the creative side. It's right. I was late, kind of late to the party. A lot of guys start writing in their twenties and a lot, but I was in my thirties before I got serious about it, but it's, it's it turned out to be what I really like. One of the things I like the most about what I do is writing songs. And especially if it's, if it's, Funny and people laugh, you know. There's nothing, nothing bigger rush than making, you know that making somebody when you hear laughter from something you said or something you sang, it's a, it's, a, it's a high. I can't explain. It's b- better than, I guess, drugs. I don't know. I'm going to do do that, but I mean, it's just a, a rush. Yeah, yeah, it really it, it, is. I mean, it's it really a, hard is. to explain it, you know. I mean, it, it, you can get hooked on that real easily. I, you know, you and I know so much about each other that I'm sitting here thinking, 
you know, we can't have like a five hour podcast, but we could do, <laughs> we could do that. Um, but I, cause I'm trying to edit like what, you know, cause I, I mentioned Vietnam, but I'm thinking, man, that's a story we got to tell at another, we'll do another one. Sure. We'll have you on the uh, blue plate special, but, sure. but, but the Vietnam stuff, uh, and how you reacted to being wounded over there. And what, what was it? How many months in the hospital? Uh, almost got, three years. Almost three years in the hospital yeah. when he got back. And yeah. and so it's a story we tell. But I, I always, it, you know, you have a, the, or I guess the the media has provided us a view of that, uh, you, know, you know, PTSD Mm-hmm. person from Vietnam. And so I, I I always like to tell people, I say, yeah, you know, when, when we're around you, go, yeah, he was wounded in Vietnam, three years in the hospital. And people are like... <laughs> they, 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 really? do it. they go, what? Yeah, because yeah. cause you're, cause you're, you're happy, you know? Yeah. One of, funny thing about the human spirit is, I, I find, and at least in a lot of guys I know, that although as tragic as that was, and, and being shot twice is not fun, and being in a hospital for three is not fun... The human mind, uh, a fairly healthy one, I think. I can look back on that and laugh about a lot of stuff. We've we've, we've had some. I've told you the story and, and made it funny. The night I got shot, I, oh, yeah. I, I make jokes about it. It wasn't funny, but the human mind, at a given time, can find humor in tragedy. You know, and and uh, that I, that is true. I mean, because you, I, I can't I can't tell you how many times I've heard you laughing, telling a story about in the stretcher, and you're telling the. The medic, there's this wet, it's wet stuff. They said, shut up, it's just your blood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't funny at the time, obviously, but I mean, you know, but it's funny now, but it's like a lot of things, you know, you know, you hear comedians do a joke about every handling can get shot and, and people will groan and they'll say, too soon? Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. because there are, eventually there are jokes made about horrible tragedies done the right way. They can be kind of humorous and, yeah, that's the great thing about the human spirit is that uh, you know you can laugh at the tragedies and because I guess I'm laughing because things are so good now you know I over, overcame that and and life has been so good you know in so many ways you know about that my hills and my valleys but you know there's been a lot more hills and valleys you know and right. I'm aware of that and I'm thankful for it man was uh, there was you have written some absolutely beautiful serious songs is this a segue is this a segue. Kind of, yeah, this could be, yeah, you because you've written some beautiful serious songs. There, there's one song that uh, I'm not, I'm not have you do this when we say this for another time, but there's one that I always thought that Randy Travis should have done. Uh, the one about the box with the pictures, the old tin box, the old tin box. Oh my God, what a great song! Yeah. And but then there was a point, and we're gonna, we're gonna do that sometime because okay. I really want to do that sometime, yeah. but. But there was a point that you started making a turn, and and the songs and and I in my mind, even though you'd already had cheap recruiting, no more food, you'd already had. Uh, I don't I don't know for some reason the song you did about you living at the beach and Jimmy Buffett flying in his jet, mm-hmm. somehow that was a sea change to me. That was a mark. It was. Uh, because it was like done so tongue in cheek. And I just thought it was put together so beautifully that I, every time I hear that song to this day, I imagine Jimmy Buffett hearing that song and just laughing like crazy just because he's going, yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. So, well, he knows who I am, so I think he probably knows that. Knows that I'm pretty sure he knows that song. Too, I know but, you and his sister, are bad, yeah, like well, big well, buddies. Well, we're friends. You know, she's been my boss for 15 years. She's a she's <laughs> a great lady. She, she she really is. I mean, that is a great organization. They you treat say you say she's a boss. She Brent plays at. Well, I call her boss. That's right. Yeah. She had a birthday recently. I just said, happy birthday, boss. I always call her boss lady, you know, <laughs> because she is. And then, I don't mind. She's a great boss. She you is know? great, oh, yeah. The, the whole organization, they treat me so well. And they treat their, their help for the restaurant business is not always a business that treats their help well. They treat their people with respect. Right. You know, I like that. I like that a lot. Do you mind doing that song? No, not at all. You know, it was a kind of turning point. That whole that whole CD, uh, somewhere in the uh, uh, early 80s, I realized that... Um, I think I thought I was going to be a serious artist. All my PR pictures are real serious-minded, like I want to be a stud, <laughs> looking, you know? Looking into Yeah, yeah looking yeah. like, you know, I'm tough, macho. I want to be a... But then I realized what I'm best at is is humor and, and tongue-in-cheek stuff, you know? Right. And, I, and I, somewhere in the 80s, I embraced that. And when I did, 
things got better. Because now this stuff is all on uh, on CDs, and how it's so like how can people reach you? Let's hit that first real well, quick. Well, eight tracks are available <laughs> through yeah. snail mail. Yeah. Just send me a check, self address stamped envelope. <laughs> you get that eight track right out. That's to right. You. Uh, just they can go to uh, iTunes or CD Baby. Or uh, brentburns.com. Okay. And maybe they pick up my stuff they like. And, uh, okay. We have hats, hats and T-shirts and, and mem- all stuff. So it's, you know, if they'd like. We'd they will sell. like. We'd they like will to, like. We'd like to sell them something, you yeah. know. Okay. Night to, this is uh, from 1998 from my CD entitled Living a Life Jimmy Buffett Only Wrote About. This song is called Living a Life Jimmy Buffett Only Wrote About. It's the <laughs> title cut for the slow folks yeah. out there. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I want to whistle here. I hope it's not too ugly. Buffett's on Broadway, I'm at the beach He's wearing Johnston Murphys, I'm in my bare feet He's rolling in the dough while I roll in the sand Picking my six string in a funky little band I'm living a life Jimmy Buffett only wrote about Let him count the money, I'll go ahead and live his life out He'll have to live vicariously Through a beer-drinking ordinary guy like me I'm living a life Jimmy Buffett wrote about He's flying his airplane I'm driving my van Living with a waitress and working on my tan He's up with the big dogs making a deal I'm down here in the real Margaritaville Just living a life Jimmy Buffett only wrote about Let him count the money I'll go ahead and live his life out He'll have to live vicariously Through a beer drinking ordinary guy like me I'm living a life Jimmy Buffett wrote about He's in the boardroom While I'm in a bar room He's dealing with stress I'll be feeling better soon Real damn soon Cause I'm living a life Jimmy Buffett only wrote about Let him count the money I'll go ahead and live his life out He'll have to live vicariously Through a beer drinking ordinary guy like me I'm living a life Jimmy Buffett wrote about Yeah, it's true, so true I'm living a life Jimmy Buffett wrote about Wow. Oh, I thought I had a... That's your phone now. I, I thought I had a lift in the car. No. <laughs> you know, that that is awesome song. Thank but, you. Uh, it's just an awesome... I think I'm most impressed that you can pick up that whistle right away. Well, Now, yeah. I hope people... Don't edit that out because you you heard. You did I hope you heard what the what the ringtone was? Oh yeah, I hope or pray to post. Yeah, the, yeah, and and so it's per, what a, segue, a perfect segue. segue. Yeah, I you know Brent is like uh, he, he has eclectic tastes. Okay, and so so I remember the day. <laughs> I ran into you and you said, "Hey, I, 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 um, I, I bought a horse," <laughs> and I, and I, you know, I'm thinking, "Okay, well, a riding know, like a riding horse." Chuck Childress, a bunch, bunch of guys have horses around here, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. And he goes, "Yeah, I got there's a guy you know, like take care of him, and he's up in where was it, Louisville, Lexington? Uh, Frank, well, Frankfurt's where the horse farm is. Yeah. Okay, and and so you, you, just tell the early <laughs> story." Of how you managed to spend a few thousand dollars on a racehorse. 
Just tell, just tell how this happened, well, and then let's hold hold the hold the the punchline okay. to the end. Well, number one, I go back to the thing that God obviously likes me, and for some reason <laughs> has chosen. Either that, or he felt real sad for you being shot. Well, I know, and getting, I mean, losing your record deal. I don't think I think I just think it's I just think that for some reason that he just uh, you know, and you know he, the horse makes up for a lot. Some some people some people aren't. Don't give me blessings and stuff like that. And of course, not to be too biblical, but that we're supposed to keep in mind, know that right. and help those who, who who aren't as fortunate because not everybody is. You right. know? So anyway, well, the horse thing. I met a guy uh, years ago named Fred Bradley. He was a retired state senator from Kentucky, also a, a, a retired general in the Air Guard. He was a, a pilot in Vietnam. A very interesting, eclectic guy, you know. And then he one day told me he had fifty racehorses. And I'm, after a while, I started thinking he was BSing me a little bit. But I found all that was true. He was a very interesting guy. And I was the only guy in town. He used to come to Pomper Olives when I played there. Only guy in town that liked to hear about the horses. I found it fascinating, the horse business. And one day I said, I'd like to, I wouldn't mind having a horse sometime like that. He said, Well, you don't want to buy one. You want to buy a piece of a bunch of horses. That way, if one, if you buy one and it breaks its leg, you're out or get sick. Yeah. He said, So he went to the auction up there in Keeneland one September. He said, he Came back and said, I bought us eight horses. Us. I went, What? So I got in for a little piece. Like he, he just wants somebody to celebrate See, you with. You got one of the eight. I got one of the eight. Yeah. yeah. I got like two or five percent of the horses, you know. Yeah. But he wanted me a part of it, you know. He because he was his friend and he wanted someone to celebrate with, you know. Right. Well, and as time went on, I, I next thing I was a ten percenter, and his son, who was our trainer, had ten percent, and Fred had to have on all the money was eighty percent. But we, when you're in a horse business, guys like Fred, they don't they don't tell everybody he's only ten percent. This is my partner. Right. This is my, and that's the way. I mean, when we're with these big races and stuff, uh, he didn't make a point to tell everybody I'm only ten percenter, because I'm his partner and we're buddies and we were best friends. He was like a second father to me. I mean, so we we were in the horse business for many years together, losing money, didn't make any money, but got to watch my horses run it and win some races. No, no big races. Um, and uh, it was it, it's one of those businesses where it's a hobby, an expensive hobby like golf or boats. And if you don't grow to love the process and the people, you'll get out because it'll run you off financially, even right. at ten percent. Right. Believe me, ten percent of ten horses is, can be a lot of money. Right. Uh, and uh, but I loved it. I loved being around Fred and the horse and stuff. And uh, and then do you want me to go and tell the rest of the story? Yeah. <laughs> then yeah. one day, but just let me tell the last day <laughs> of seeing you get on the airplane with that hat on and go into an auction. But go ahead, go ahead. So, <laughs> so. So one day, Fred's uh, son, Buff, called me, our trainer, and said, i got something really important to talk to you about. I go, oh, I thought, is, is Fred okay? And he said, no, Fred's fine. Fred had moved back up to Kentucky by now. He said, no, you, you know, we got a horse named Groupie Doll who's doing pretty good. I said, yeah, I've been following her. She's really good. He says, we think she could be something special. She'd already run some, won some pretty big races. We think she could be something super special. And me and Fred want you, you and Carl, partners from another partnership, we want you guys to be a part of, of this because we think it's going to be something big. So he offered to let me buy 10% of the horse. And it wasn't cheap for a guitar playing guy from uh, Gulf Shores. But uh, I asked Pam about it. I said, Pam, what do you think? And she said, that's your, that's your call. So I said, yes. I swallowed hard and I sent a big check up north for 10% of this race horse who the next day could have gone lame, you know, right. gotten a cold and not be able to, you know, they, they're very sensitive. They, and uh, right after I bought in, she reeled off five. Uh, graded stakes races in a row, including Breeder, Breeders' Cup World Championship. She won the Breeders' Cup. And she, not only that, but... but one she of her, became uh, the first horse, right? Uh, the first horse... To win. Oh, there's she won two Breeders' Cups in a row, uh, which is there's only, of all the horses ever raced, only, I think, eight or nine ever did that. I oh, think really? something like that, yeah. It's very, very few ever won it two years in a row. I mean, it just didn't happen. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but one of her great races, my favorite race she ever ran was at Churchill Downs on Derby Day. Uh, and 2012, it was Derby Day, and she was in the sixth race. It was a graded one race, you know, the top race. And she broke the track record. Uh, it's been standing for like 14 years. Oh, and, my gosh. Uh, seven, seven furlongs. That was her race, seven furlongs. But she was great. I mean, and she was a cheap, you know, we, we, we're not multi-million dollar breeders. We're right, guys who buy, you know, $10,000 horses and breed them to $5,000 studs as opposed to buying $5 million horses and breed them to right. Five hundred thousand dollars studs. We're we're blue collar guys. So. Yeah. So you have this ten thousand dollar horse that's won the Breeders' Cup twice. Yeah. And then, then the day comes. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Yeah. I, I was on an airplane. I know I'm running this shot. I and know I'm I see this I shot. see Brent and Pam get on the plane, and we go, hey, hey, and Brent, Brent's wearing this droopy doll hat. 
And and I said, where are you guys going? And Brent says, said, well, well, I, uh, we're we're going to an auction. We're you know they're, we're going to sell Groupie Doll. And I said, really? He said, yeah, you know, it's a business, and and uh, you know, it's it's really time. It's uh, it's time. If we're you know, she's a filly, and it's just, uh, it's really time. <laughs> and I said, okay, buddy. So uh, let me ask you, like. How much do you think you might get for this horse? You know, and Brent says, Brent says, well, you know, I, I we, we, it, it could possibly be a million dollars. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me! It could be a million dollars. And and so, hey, you want to tell him what it was? I mean, you look this up. I mean, Brent, <laughs> he called me a day later, and it, it, you were more excited that the horse was staying in America and not going to Saudi Arabia. Yeah, yeah. I was more excited about the number. <laughs> Well, you know, she's sold for we had we had a one point nine million dollar you know on, on her, which she couldn't sell any less than that. What do you call it? A, a hold on a reserve, her. reserve, yeah. reserve. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, and and she sold for she blew past that real quick, and she sold for a three point two, three point one, three point one, three point one. It says three point two on Wikipedia. Well, I'd go with you. Their, always exaggerate stuff. Well, yeah. I would go. I would, I would go with the Wikipedia number. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, even though their numbers on me are like way low, and we can't get them changed. I don't in, know what the deal weird? is. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, but I, I was only ten percent owner. And don't forget. Just keep in mind. Uh, it, yeah, we can all figure ten no, percent of no, three point two. You have to pay. You have to pay, pay. There's expenses along the way. I know. And, and don't forget, I was in the business. Four mouth it for me. Go I was, ahead. I was in. The, I was in business for like you know fourteen years or twelve years. And I. I, I know you spent, lost money. Yeah, you lost. Yeah, those I know. years yeah. I did. Yeah, I did. yeah okay. She yeah. made. She did make up for it, and then some. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was still. I wouldn't take it back for nothing. Okay, I'm not. I'm not saying it wasn't something, but it was. Listen, you know, man, that it is, sounds bigger than it is. That is a. That's such a great story, and that is my go-to horse racing story because yeah. I don't know anything about horse racing, and so anytime you know you go to these parties, I, I, I actually uh, had a, an agent take me to the Belmont Stakes, yeah. and was in that VIP thing. But I was the hit of the whole day because I had that groupie doll story. <laughs> Nobody else knew what was going on either, but I had that story. Well, I mean, honestly, I don't know much about the horse business either. That's what's amazing about it. I'm just an observer, really. I, I don't know a lot about it, but but I love the process and I love the horses. And there's nothing more exciting, even if it's a claiming horse, for have your horse come out of that gate in a race. It, it's exciting. That's why people stay in it. It's just a thrill, you know. And when they win, mm. it's a when they win big money. It's even a. And yeah, she was a one of the great fillers of all times. You know, uh, I was just sitting here watching you and thinking, um, Austin and Adam are going to be very, very excited that you were on this. Oh, wow. Good on kids. The show. They uh, they have grown up with you and Levy. How, how are Buster and Nicole? They're, they're doing right? fine. Doing fine. Yeah, and Patrick got one more. Patrick. Yeah, yeah. They're doing fine. You know, Buster's living here, and uh, Nicole's in in Dallas. Just finished a, a, a training to be an X ray person. She you know she had a degree in hosp- uh, hospitality from Arizona State, but she just didn't want to be in sales anymore. She wanted to work in hospitals, so she's back to school doing that. And uh, two grandkids there, and three in Arizona, and. And I'm still working. That is why. amazing. I don't know why. I, I can't seem to quit. And this this pandemic thing, I was home for a couple of months here, total, pretty much isolated, and I uh, thought I'd get a bunch of stuff done, you know, because I had time. I didn't because I, I, I'm one of these guys, I have to have a deadline. I have to be, you know, if someone has to say, be at the studio at 845 right. for me to say, okay. And, you know, I, well, that's it, one reason I'm, I'm amazed that you write so consistently. I can see how Jimmy Yuri writes consistently because he goes downtown Nashville, Sony building every, every day. day. Yeah, those, you know? those guys do that. And and so I can see how you do it. But you and I work a lot alike. We're alone, you know. And, yeah, and yeah. so I know how hard it is to make yourself sit down. But that's why people say, oh, you must love writing. I say, well, you know, I like having it, written. It's a lo- it's a, oh, no, it's it, it's the same thing as songwriting. It's a love-hate thing, you know. Yeah. I have to make myself do it some days. I, I must... Throw a plug in for my major co writer, Bill White, who's in Nashville. He has re- co written. We wrote right on Zoom a lot uh, or stuff like that. And uh, he's written about half the songs on my latest CD, late, la- last CD. And he's a really talented guy. He's in the Country Broadcasters Hall of Fame, by the way. Really? He's really a, a talented guy. And one of the, you'd love, he's a great guy and funny. Funny, funny guy. Morning Drive radio guy. Well, I want to get one more song out of you before okay. we end this episode. Well, I, I know that within a year we're going to have on the professional noticer, uh, we'll have uh, Brent Burns Part 1, Brent Burns Part 2, Brent Burns Part 3, and we're going to get you on the Blue Plate Special too. Okay. The, uh, but 
I am uh, fascinated by this song okay. because this is your song that is most loved and most hated, um, the Snowbird song. Oh, um, because I, I think that the Snowbirds uh, and you know the whole song is poking fun at, uh, at it's, if you're not from a resort town, you may not totally get this. Or let's let's put it this way: you'll get it. You just can't appreciate it. Until you lived it. Until you have lived it. Okay. Uh, I was, in fact, I was talking to Adam today, Adam this morning, uh, coming in, and I said, I said, buddy, I said, you know, uh, in fact, I told Adam, I said, uh, Brent's going to be here with me today. And I said, I'm sure we're going to talk about snowbirds. And, and he said, man, they just drive me crazy. They drive me crazy. I said, buddy, you're too young to have anybody drive you crazy. I said, and, and you know, the tragedy that happens with some of them. He said, what tragedy? I said, well, you know, every year here, they come down and four or five of them die in their cars, like right in the middle of the road. And, and he said, really? I said, yeah, they don't hit anything or anything. Just the kudzu gets them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because they're going. Yeah, they're going so slow. The yeah, kudzu just has grows around. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But we we all talk about. Oh my gosh, you know, because we all have the stories of well them, you know, and this that's the time of the year around here that they don't put the salt and pepper on the table. They don't put the right. sugar things on the table. You have to ask for it. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to say that the snowbirds drive slow, but if you're driving around Gulf Shores, Orange Beach in February, and a car from Michigan passes you, it's stolen. <laughs> you can be sure. But, you know, they, they actually do a lot of great things for our community while they're down here. They, they, while they're down here, January, February, March, they do a lot of great things for our community. Um, can't think of one right now. Uh, uh, wait, okay, wait, I thought of one. Okay. Uh, while they're here, it's a, it's a, much, a much safer uh, community because we don't have any, and I mean any high-speed accidents. So it's safer on the roads. And it's an also a more intelligent community because we're from Alabama, and not many of us locals can figure a three percent tip in our headlines. <laughs> Your head so, like that. So, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's you know, people think I'm lying that you know signs go up in restaurant bathrooms don't take the toilet paper. Yeah, I mean, people think I'm lying, <laughs> and you know, talk to Benny at Publix about about people literally in March when they go home bringing canned goods back to the store and trying to return them. Yeah. Well, they uh, it, what Bill White always says what he can't believe about it is uh, I insult them. I don't just sing that song. I insult them all night long about you and know, they love a, about their age and and their their kleptomaniacs and 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 they come in they buy my dang CDs. He says it's the craziest thing in the world. You insult them constantly, but then I say you know how many of those people from Michigan have told jokes about people from Alabama and no teeth job. You know they have been picking on Southerners forever, right? right? Have they not? Right. You know if you don't believe me, watch the Jerry Springer show. You know. Right. Right. <laughs> so, but it is hilarious because you do you go after them and they just think it is just the greatest. Thing you call them kleptomaniacs because they take all the you know the sauces off the table and now I, I draw the real good natured ones. There are the all those guys that come. Oh, there are some mean ones that oh, they, don't they, like that. They song. play they play golf with guys that said, "Yeah, he thinks he's so dang funny. He's not funny to me. It's not you know." They just get insulted. They, the, the guys that hate me, I, I, they tell me I got to play golf. The guy just he, he hates you. I go, <laughs> well, tell him I tell him I said thanks. He said, "What do you mean?" Well, the song wouldn't be funny without him. He's right. what this, he's the one of the songs about. That's why it's funny. Yeah, because of those those odd cranky old people that call themselves snowbirds. That's exactly <laughs> right. Okay, sing the song. All right, sing all right. the song. All right. All right. A little rusty here. <laughs> and a one and a two. Migration every year, the birds head south. They're flocking down the freeways. Even now, they really think they're flying down the road. 40 miles an hour in a 60 zone. <laughs> So if it's snowbird season, why can't we shoot them? Pull, tag them and bag them and ship them back overnight air. So take your big car and your attitude and your wife's blue hair. Don't tell me how you do it up north, because we don't care. 
Hit me, band. And a one and a two. This is where the snowbirds start to polka around the dance floor. <laughs> Here we go. They cut in line at the grocery store and I go a little nuts. My favorite seat at church is where they sit their butts. <laughs> well, I think I'm going crazy and I might crack. Well, I could go postal anytime. Someone hold me back. If it's snowbird season, why can't we shoot them? Pull, tag them in, bag them in, ship them back overnight here. So take your big car and your attitude and your wife's blue hair. Don't tell me how you do it up north, cause we don't care. You know, some of my best friends are snowbirds, it's true. If you're offended by my little song, this song's about you. <laughs> if it's snowbird season, why can't we shoot them? Pull, tag them in, bag them in, ship them back overnight air. So take your big car and your attitude and your wife's blue hair. Don't tell me how you do it up north, cause we don't care. Yeah, don't tell us how you do it up north, cause we don't care. Man, how great. It, and you, you know, for for people who are gonna come down, you come down here, you gotta find you gotta find Brent. And there is nothing like being in a crowd of people. I, I remember being at the Shrimp Festival and you have like five or 10,000 people around you and everybody going, so take your hair and your attitude and your wife's blue hair. I mean, the whole crowd singing the song. So yeah. people love Brent and and I'm one of those people. I Thank you, buddy. I love him back. I, I appreciate so much you being here. With us, and, fun, and just promise me you'll come back. Absolutely. Okay, and yeah. so we got your brentburns.com, mm -hmm. and uh, they hats, t-shirts, snowbird items. They and come and come hear me play. Come yeah. hear me sing. Yeah, yeah, because your your schedule is there, and so if you're in town, this is such a great thing, and this is one of those one of those things that the locals do. I mean, every, you know. People who live here don't go out all the time, like people who are vacation. Right. But when they go out, they go here, Brent. Thanks. You know. So thank you, buddy. You bet. Appreciate it. I'm Andy Andrews, the professional noticer, harnessing common sense and wisdom to plow through challenges all the way to an answer for you. Hey, quick question: Where do you seek wisdom? Allow me to suggest wisdomharbor.com. Check it out. That's wisdom h a r b o u r dot com. And I think that'll do it for this week. Get us out of here, Matthew. So, ladies and gentlemen, and to the boys and girls who aspire to become ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of another episode of The Professional Noticer. In a world where common sense has become a superpower, I'm harnessing the tiny bit of mental energy I have for you, seeking wisdom, making observations, and endeavoring to answer tough questions in a way that will empower your family, and your business. I'm Andy Andrews. Until next week, smile while you talk, even behind that mask. Don't breathe anybody else's air yet. Not time. But make sure you have a positive answer to the question, how's it going? And so, until next week, goodbye. This episode of The Professional Noticer was produced by Matt Limpert. The Noticer theme, written and performed by Sugarcane Jane. Tropical Nuts, provided by Twinkle and Smoke of Beverly Hills. Additional financial consideration provided by the Embarrassing Dad's Handbook. Are you the father of teenagers? Those semi-human life forms that used to be so nice and ran into your arms every day after work and laughed at all your jokes? But now they're taller, gawkier, with fuzzy skin and smart mouths. Now when you walk into the room, sometimes they walk out. And if they stay, the teenager is sullen or appears to be bored. This, friend, is where the Embarrassing Dad's Handbook can help. It's a manual put together by experts specifically designed to save the relationship between you and your team. For now, all you need to know is that your child still loves you. But it's time to show them your feelings 
in a different way. Nothing says I love you more clearly to a teenager than a father who cares enough to embarrass them. The Embarrassing Dad's Handbook will teach you how to dress around your teen. One section emphasizes the necessity of black dress socks with sandals and Bermuda shorts. The handbook contains suggestions for conversation topics when you find yourself in the presence of your teen and their friends. Learn how to talk about things like what real music is, how you acted when you were their age, and urinary tract dysfunctions. The Embarrassing Dad's Handbook is a treasure trove of vocabulary that will be a hit the next time you have teenagers in your car. You'll soon master the skill of including expressions like groovy and far out, in addition to properly referring to anyone who smokes a cigarette as a sinner. The handbook also contains situational awareness tips so that you'll know exactly when to dial up your teenager's nerves by talking too loud, eating too much, staying too long, not staying long enough, and all the many things your kid seems to no longer like about you. So order now. Why wait? Your teenager needs the love only you can show. Find that love language in the Embarrassing Dad's Handbook.